1972, um, it was the annual milk round, as it's called, for universities, and I applied to join the British Antarctic Survey, having had an interest in the polar environment for many, many years. After a great deal of uh, toing and froing down to London and getting interviewed and then having my appendix out, I duly sailed and uh, roughly 50 years today we would be crossing the equator on our way to our first stop in Montevideo. But to backtrack a little bit, where does the British Antarctic Survey come from and what started it all off? Well of course we've all heard of Shackleton and Scott and Bortgrinovy, Nordenskold and a lot of other people doing Antarctic research, but how many from the UK? Bruce set up an organisation in 1907 for a Scottish expedition in Lorry Island. It was offered to the British uh, government when he came back to the UK, but they didn't take it up. And so there was a bit of a dearth of research until in 1944, the British government decided that they would want to put a base down there to investigate what the Germans were doing down the peninsula. What the Germans had done was to fly over in bombers dropping brass darts in with a swastika all over the peninsula in the hope that they would claim that for Germany. And there was an operation called Operation Tabarin and Operation Tabarin was set up, uh, Tabarin was a nightclub in London and it was deemed appropriate that everything that went on there is in the dark and we would be going down into the dark of the Antarctic winter. This then developed into the Falklands Islands Dependency Survey or FIDS. So if anybody who goes down in winters they are called FIDS. Uh, I'll leave it to your imagination with the F but the rest of it stands for idiots down south. <laughs> Some of you may be old enough to remember a uh, Transantarctic expedition back in 1957 where Fuchs set off from uh, the Weddell Sea, we'll see pictures of that, and then he went up to, uh, to uh, Pole Station, uh, Anderson Scott Station it's called now, and then met up with Ed Hillary who had come up in modified 3035 tractors all the way from McMurdo up onto the Pole of Pato. He then went down back to McRoder and came back from there. And at that point it was decided to change it from the Falkland Islands Dependency Survey to the British Antarctic Survey, and he was the first director of that survey. Headquarters in Gillingham Street in London, which have now moved to a campus in Cambridge. So to paraphrase Confucius, the longest journey starts with a single step, the longest voyage starts with a single wave. Just a few photographs to set the, the general tone of things. This is down at Halley Bay, up into South Georgia waters. Now we'll have to take a look at South Georgia. Does anybody remember Dick Barton, Special Agent? You have to be of a certain age to remember that. For those who've got excellent eyesight, you'll see down in the bottom left-hand corner there that a lot of the survey work was done by Duncan Cass, who played Dick Barton. Now, where is South Georgia? And South Georgia is roughly the same latitude as here. In the Southern Hemisphere, it's 35 degrees west of the meridian. And as you can see from all the blue on the island, those are the glaciers. Or rather, they were the glaciers in the 50s. If we look at the south part of the island here, it's, it's very exposed. There's no uh, bases or anything usable down here. And then we come up to this peninsula, the Bath Peninsula, and that is where you've got Ocean Harbour and Gobthorne, and they would tie up the factory ships in there. Coming into Cumberland East Bay, out to Gritviken where I was based, and the Gritviken Whaling Station. And moving around into here, we've got Leith Harbour, Stromness and Husvik. And further up here, we've got King Harkon Bay. So, on this side of the Where's the, uh, there we are. King Harkin Bay, which is where Shackleton landed. Across here is Prince Olaf. So Shackleton managed to get himself down here and into that point there, across the start of the Col Larsen Plateau. In the Northern Hemisphere, we have a circulation of water called the Gulf Stream, which circulates in a horizontal plane. Down in the south, 
It's called the South Atlantic Gyre, and that circulates in a vertical plane, which means that South Georgia gets washed with very cold water. Average annual temperature of that place is 0.8, seawater temperature down to minus 1.8. It's not warm. So let's plough through a few slides. That's the base. The big green building at the back, that's Shackleton House, and that is where we lived. The rest of the buildings coming uh, remainder from the uh, colonial days and, and the colonial administration when it looked after the whole island. This is Gridviken. Um, just to point a few places out, there's ski lift, ski uh, jump here. Church at the background, that's still standing. The new barracks are standing. Floating docks sunk. This is where the, uh, the whales were brought up onto the plan. And then we've got Tayuka uh, jetty there with the uh, two, three catchers, the Albatross, the Petrel, and the Diaz. And of course, everything has to come in by ship. This is a ship called the, the John Bisco. Very old ship, 1950 built, same age as me. Uh, that's been converted into bean cans as well. So, we have to cart things backwards and forwards for Gridviken, of course, because um, it's a derelict station, so we use bits of steel, so we built this one day, called it Super Looter. And what research did we do? Meteorology, which is what I was, glaciology, zoology, but uh, botany. Uh, we're looking at benthic survey work as well as literal survey work, which is what we're doing here. Time span in the water, 20 minutes. Time span without a wetsuit on, about two. Naturally, you want generators. These were uh, diesel generators um, made by Dales, the two small ones, and in the background was a big three-cylinder one which ran continuously for a year because we couldn't get the others to run. That happens to be me underneath bringing new pistons in today. Now, of course, South Georgia is where Shackleton died, and his uh, coffin is buried in the Gridbican Cemetery, and his shipmates erected this cross, called, obviously, Shackleton's Cross, just behind the base, uh, and was the scene of a few uh, barbecues and um, light refreshments, ladies and gentlemen. And, of course, there's Shackleton's grave. Now... A few years ago, they found the ashes of Frank Wilde, Shackleton's right-hand man, and the cruise ship company got hold of the family and said, would you like to bury him next to the boss? Yes, please. So they shipped the family down to South Georgia, and just to the right of that is a, a small uh, plaque in, set in the ground with his... Um, date of birth and date of death. Uh, he had a fairly checkered career after he left Shackleton's expeditions and uh, battles on the Somme and things like that. Of course, not everything's work. Um, you don't come home, you don't get a holiday. In terms of communications, you're allowed 100 words a month, and that was it. So, because one of the chaps, he was with the RAF, he was a cook with the RAF, he decided we'd have a Japanese night. So, um, we did. Now, our big celebration is not Christmas. Christmas is the middle of summer. Christmas is a working day. But midwinter is the celebration, 21st of June. Uh, my birthday happened to be the 19th, so I was always banned. And my birthday was put where there was never a holiday uh, or a, another <coughs> suitably inebriated uh, effort. you recognise some of the, the names on there and a few of the bottles on there. <laughs> now, there's a serious note on this one. Has anybody been south, by the way? Has anybody been? You have been? South Georgia? Peninsula? You'll notice a few changes. That piece of triangular stuff is baleen. If you look at it carefully, you'll see on the left-hand side all the whiskers. It's the whiskers that catch the krill. 
and then the tongue scrapes it off and that's what the, all the baleen whales live on. When it was uh, in, in the whaling times, that was taken off and used for stays on ladies' corsets. It's one of the use. I always reckon it would have been better leaving it on the animal, but that's a slightly contentious issue. Now, sadly looking at this, a couple of uh, gentlemen have passed on. The gentleman in the middle, he is one of the uh, specialists um, on rats and rat eradication for subantarctic islands. He was a, a chippy. This gentleman eventually ended up working for Bass and got the Polar Medal for, for uh, services to the British Antarctic Survey. Whilst the gentleman playing the flute was a chap called Dr. Frank Riding. And he ended up as the, govern the government's chief, I don't know how you describe it, emergency relief specialist. So if there was things like Montserrat or others, then they would ship him out and he'd assess and, and organise all the medical stuff going in. No hairdressers. Nearest ladies were a thousand miles away in Port Stanley. You cut mine, I'm going to cut yours, boy. You can imagine the state of some of the hairstyles. Now, fur seals were almost eradicated for their pelts for use in clothing. Very warm, very dense fur. And they were a source of um, great interest if one turned up on the base. Now those who've been down to South Georgia since will notice they're an absolute pest because they get everywhere, they are aggressive and the, the, the rate of, and, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, growth in the population has been immense. Two elephant seals, two bulls fighting, beach masters. Just gives you an idea of the size of a, of a, a big bull. Four and a half ton, biggest one recorded is just over four and a half ton, 22 feet long. And I can give you a very nasty gummy suck. And that's why they're called elephant seals, <coughs> with this inflatable proboscis. Yeah, you don't, you don't lie down when they're around. Very rich milk, and the pups are putting on uh, doubling, tripling the body weight in three weeks. And then off they go and that's it. Parental care over and done with, you're on your own. Now, these are the early wallows. And yes, it does look rather revolting, and it is. It's extremely smelly, and you are definitely persona non grata if you fall in. Now, they have to come out and molt off their old fur and get a fresh waterproof coating. But when we used to get the Russians coming in on base, the Russian ships in those days, the trawlers, research vessels, were run by commissars and not by the captains and crew. So they would come up onto base and we would use all the awful spirits, distill it, off and make tussock wine with green food dye. Yet the commissars absolutely rattled. They thought they were taking a shortcut back to their ship, which they weren't, and they'd fall in here. And it gave the crew great delight in hosing them down with a fire hose because they were extremely unpopular. And that is just an idea of a group of Ellies on, on the side of the Northern Shore Glacier. And you can see how many are there, about 1,000, 1,200 in that photo. Moving a little bit south, these are crab eater seals. Again, you will possibly see on the left hand one there are three stripes, that's where it's been attacked by an orca or a killer whale. That is a leopard seal, came up on South Georgia, so it was fast asleep, so three of us were there. Um, it was my job to go around the back of it and give it a dent and nudge while somebody else used my camera to take the photographs with it. Moving further south, you people have been to Deception? Yeah. You'll recognise that's on the beach at Deception, it's the Weddell Sea. 
This is taken 10 years after the cessation of whaling on South Georgia. And just look at this, a winky, minky whale. Then you've got a chap on board, one of the launches. Totally fearless, just swimming round and round the ship. Black-browed albatross, these are taken up on Bird Island. Um, it's a big centre for the, the mollymorks, which are the black-browed and the grey-headed albatross. And there's a grey-headed albatross there. If the chick falls out of that, it's finished. The, the bird does not pick up its young and bring it back into the nest. That's it. It's got to get back up on its own. Just to give you an idea, that is a, um, a wandering albatross, given the size of the thing. Research using satellite uh, tracking systems found that a lot of the black-browed, grey-headed, and to an extent the wanderers, the females go north, the males go south. And the problem is that the females get caught as bycatch in the longlining industry. They come back to breed, and there's maybe one female with half a dozen males, and they just cannot handle it, and off they go, and just fly around Antarctica a few times. Black uh, sorry, a sooty albatross. And they fly in pairs like a, a biplane, absolutely stunning flyers. They're called non-energetic, uh, and the rougher the weather, the better it is. Like gannets, but bigger. And so they use the fact that when you get a wave coming up, what happens to the air? And the air is pushed up like a piston. So they ride this piston of air and then glide to the next one. Bigger the wave, higher they go, longer they can fly. Rarely see them flap. That's a, a young uh, sooty albatross. These are what we call blue-eyed shags, and they've now been renamed to imperial shags. With its young, the young looks bigger than the, uh, the adult there on that one. There's typical vegetation of South Georgia, and the Falkland Islands, and a lot of other sub-Antarctic islands, tussock grass. He's taken just outside the dry spot. <coughs> Even in those days, we were looking at heavy metal analysis, uh, and we had to take uh, three, a youngster, a cow, and a male um, elephant seal to do heavy metal analysis, lead, sinks, cadmium, and all this stuff. So it's not, it's not a new science. This is a giant petrel, otherwise known as stinkers, with a couple of its young. You don't get close to these things, they have a nasty habit of vomiting all over you, and it's very smelly. Now, this is a seabird that doesn't have webbed feet. For obvious reasons, it's called a paddy. Skewers, like the bunksy we have in the Northern Hemisphere, um, these are uh, McCormick skewers, slightly different shape, but both serving very much the same purpose. And that's one of its young. Now, for those who worked on coast care, you will recognise this horrible plant in front of you, with the purpley top to it, it's called a kina. You'll otherwise know it as piri piri, it's endemic. On South George, it's not an imported species, it is endemic, um, and it gets all into your socks and trousers and all the rest, it's an absolute pain. And giant petrel chick. That's a snow petrel. The only thing that's black is it's big, two eyes and two feet. Um, and if you see them flying around in a whiteout, it's very disorientating. Cape pigeon, otherwise known as a pintado petrel. Uh, some people call them a whale bird because they followed the, the whales uh, and uh, lived on the krill that came off the plan and the whaling station processing. Antarctic tern or Arctic tern, you're only going to have to find out by doing a taxonomic survey of the thing.
Gento penguins, um, very common species on South Georgia and a lot of the Subantarctic islands and the Falklands, see them all over. And yes, I've still got that anorak, it's not quite as pristine as that one. Make excellent eating to the eggs. Um, they, they lay two and you can get a fresh one. Uh, the, the yolks are bright orange, but the whites that we know as white remain clear when they're cooked. So they're good as omelettes, but not as good as a, as a boiled egg. Macaroni penguins. That's about 150,000 of them. That's on Bird Island. It's a place that you'll never ever get to. Uh, it's not allowed. Uh, no access at all on there. Chin, traps, chin strap penguins. It's a very strange rookery this. Every seven years it, it crashes due to a form of avian cholera. And then it builds back up again. And then reaches a critical population density and then wipes out again. Now, when you go down to the Antarctic or out Georgia, they give you quite rigorous guidelines as to how close you can get to the wildlife. Giant petrels 25 metres, penguins 10 metres. Nobody tells the penguins so. <laughs> These are king penguins. And you'll see on the top of the uh, left-hand one all this like moss. That is the old plumage molting out before they can go back to sea again. They're looking a bit raggy. The daily penguin, they are more southerly, uh, very, very rare to get them up onto the, the South Georgia um, and to an extent the South Shetlands as well. Those are two of the only photographs I managed to get. They're emperor penguins, and that's taken down at the bottom of the weather sea about 75 degrees south. And immature goals. Dominican gull or Laris Dominicus, um, that's the base buildings behind it, just sitting on a chunk of ice on the uh, foreshore. We do have on South Georgia uh, an endemic species, and this is the South Georgia pinto. Um, my wife and I acted as hide guides at Salton, RSVB Salton for many years till we moved up to Berry. And this character said, oh no, it's, it's a hybridization, it's this, it's that. It was only discovered in 1991 or something. <coughs> he didn't like it when we put uh, Bernard Stonehouse's book in front of him. You've all heard of krill? That's krill. That was a flush that came in one night. Um, we had with us a chap called Nigel Bonner. He was one of the high ups in the biological sciences of Bath. And he'd worked as a, um, a what's the word, whaling inspector, I think is the best description of him, to make sure that everything was okay and then the meat could go for um, human consumption and such like. And he'd never seen this much of krill. To give you an idea, that's the size of it. Now, bearing in mind, work out how many of those a blue whale has eaten in its life scan. The whole, um, that's the word I'm looking for, um, life of the krill is based on iron, we've just found. 
So with people taking krill out, you are reducing the amount of iron that's in the marine environment and you're reducing the uh, ability of the great whales to increase in their numbers. These are a few that's photos of photos ad infinitum. These are catcher vessels. You'll see the harpoon on the left hand side there. The gangway that runs from the bridge down to the, uh, the shooter's station. And then they have the whales alongside being towed into Gridbick and or one of the other whaling stations. Particularly gruesome. Right whales are called right whales because they float, so they're the right ones to catch. So what they did with these was to shove an enormous hypodermic needle into them and blow up the compressed air, which was particularly gruesome. And this is on the plan at Gritviken. And then you had the, the flensers and the lemmers. The flensers are the guys that's on there at the moment. They're cutting through the uh, blubber and skin. That goes off for rendering. And then the flesh is removed by the lemmers. In 1929, there was a moratorium uh, on whaling in South Georgia waters. That's baleen, by the way, you can see coming off. And what they found was that prior to 1929, all the bones were dispensed with, they were thrown overboard. They found 30% of the oil of a whale is contained in the bones, and so it was made compulsory to treat the bones and take all that, otherwise you were just wasting a very valuable resource. And I think perhaps some of the older members of society will remember eating just after the war. I certainly do. Sea beef. Sea beef as well, mate. Fishing uh, for notothenia and various other ice fish is, is very common now, long liners, the toothfish. And that is where the government of South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands gets its revenue from. This is an ice fish, this is Notothenia uh, rossii at the front, and the one that looks a bit like, um, what's the word, the uh, ugly one that you get, that's Notothenia neglecta. And these look a bit like trout, that's uh, Chamsocephalus gunneri. And that is another one that is, is currently being caught by the longliners and such like. Reindeer were imported into South Georgia in 1911, 14 and 15 to provide sport and to provide fresh meat for the whaling stations. Now, the snag is that they've done horrendous damage to the tussock grass and just carved it down to that. This is damage that's going to take decades to recover. And so a few years ago they culled all the reindeer out, uh, sold a lot of the meat to the cruise ships and sold a lot of the meat on the world market. Um, Norwegians were specialists in this and they, they took it out. Uh, we used to take a few for research and, and save all the sirlines up until we had enough to do a desperate damn cow pie for everybody. You see it's just finishing the end of uh, the velvet stage of its antler growth. That's a duck from the Falkland Islands. And a Rob's Cobb's Wren from the Falklands as well. This is a typical field station. Uh, tent up on the top and then a plastic workman's hut down below in which you cooked and stored your food and all the rest of it. Uh, we're looking at the reindeer observation on there. And that is the HMS Endurance, <coughs> the Navy's ice patrol ship. She one of the Danline ships, and Danline were um, all named after the daughters of a Danish gentleman. Uh, that one is the old Anita Dam, and they crammed something like 200 men on onto that. Um, I knew the captain's writer. Everybody on there is a volunteer. You have to apply for it. And he'd done two trips on her and his wife turned around to him and said, 
it's, it's either me or the ship is return us. It's the most difficult decision he's ever made in his life. <laughs> and of course, they help move field parties, fuel drums and such like around the island. Now, this is the first time that many of us have seen ladies for some 15 months. And this is the Lindblad Explorer. Um, a ship commissioned by Lars Lindblad and she would go to the more remote places in the world, like going up the Amazon, and she came into South Georgia for a night, and uh, a few of us were entertained on board and treated to a slap-up steak meal, which was very, very pleasant. So she came, and she went. Now, these are Russian. Uh, this one is the uh, Professor Academic uh, Nipovich. Um, the research trial is looking at the biomass and benthic survey work down south. Typical weather conditions in the winter, that particular photograph, it's blowing 18 knots and it's minus 18. It's not pleasant and we're taking stuff up to uh, the buildings to put a new wet lab in. Typical vegetation, mosses, short grasses, apart from the tussock grass, and then the Akina in the prominent display. Moving slightly further south, it's the start of the sea freezing, um, and it freezes, breaks up, the bits and pieces of ice then rub against one another, get rounded, form a little ring, water comes in the middle, freezes, and that's called pancake ice. Halfway through one winter, um, we managed to get five days off and we, uh, we went off uh, by boat, got dropped off and then walked around to the other whaling stations. So we're walking into one of the uh, whaling stations. You'll see in the background the beautiful lenticular cloud up here. Now this is caused by the wind bouncing over the mountain tops, condensing out. You'll often see this over the... Uh, the Pennines, very spectacular clouds. Um, it's, its correct name is lenticular from the shape of it. Um, orographic being caused by hills and mountains. Altocumulus is the height of the cloud, which is the mid-range cloud from about 10 to 20,000 feet up. Now, this is one glacier called the, the Hamburg Glacier. It's now melted back to approximately here. This one is the Harker Glacier. That one's gone back, similarly. This is a shot looking into, in the bottom of it, is Strom Ness, and that's one of the ridges that Shackleton um, came over, looking straight into the sun. Typical summer's day, 80 knots of wind, and the sea boiling. Well, it's just as dawn's breaking over the, the Bath Peninsula. Typical iceberg seas have uh, drifted up either from South Georgia grass glaciers or mainly come off the, the Weddell Sea like the uh, A148 that broke off a couple of years ago. And these are the residue that come into South Georgia. It's the Hamburg overspill that we saw earlier. Um, it comes from up this direction and then drops into these lakes. And as Carl will tell you, an excellent example of terminals marine, sir. Thank you. This glacier we see across here, that one has melted back eight kilometers. <coughs> this one in the middle of the Geeky, that's melted back about three, and this one's a new Maya glacier, and that's back to this sort of level here. That's in 50 years. <coughs> Typical walking in the mountains shot. You do get this occasional beautiful weather down there. It's not all storms and conditions.
you know, this this glacier, the new Mayat, is up here. That is one of our boatmen. It's the snout of the Hamburg Glacier. The SAS in, in 1982 said, well, we can cross that. <coughs> it's still waiting for its first crossing. This is the highest mountain on South Georgia. This is uh, Mount Paget, just around about 9,000 feet. Um, it's like Everest, but at sea level. Very, very savage conditions. It was first climbed by a joint service expedition back in about 1956, I think it was. That's Strom Ness Whaling Station. Now, this glacier here, these, this is called Twin Peaks. And this glacier was instrumented with uh, runoff for things like ablation, precipitation, all this good stuff. That does not exist any longer. So the base building is just down here, and this is Grip Vickens, just looking due north into the South Atlantic. Typical field hut. That is the Northern Skull Glacier. That's just under four miles wide. I don't know how far that one's gone back. I haven't compared it yet. Anybody heard of Steve Venables? Well-known climber. These are the mountains that he went down with Skip Novak to climb over the last couple of decades. Just trying to cross the glacier here. We actually managed to walk up here in donkey jackets and wellies. <clears throat> we shouldn't have done, but we did. Prince Olaf Harbour, this is one of the oldest whaling stations, that closed in 1928-29 season. Now we start to head away from South Georgia down into the Weddell Sea and we sail through this for a couple of days. Until we got to Halley Bay where we tied up and uh, offloaded thousands of drums of fuel and a new building to build a new base. Typical transport, muskeg tractors towing sledges. Um, wheel transport is absolutely no good. You've probably heard of Halley Bay. It's the one that um, gets abandoned in the winter at the present time because they don't know whether that particular section of the Brunt Ice Shelf is going to drift off or not. And that's me driving the tractor. So we're building up these tubes into which we put the building so the tubes take all the stress of the, the ice coming on top of it. That, that's six feet a year. Typical uh, tunnel underground. If you want to hang anything up, bang a piece of wood in the wall and hang your cable up. Pipes are no good, but this is anything with a red label on it or a red stripe on it is food. So all the food comes in. Oh, that's me in, uh, looking very salubrious. Bass at that point was running two twin otters. And these are aircraft that flew from the peninsula across to Halley Bay, bringing people and bringing supplies. Now they run four, and they run a Dash 8, which is a four-engined uh, and lands on ice on wheels, which is a scary thought. Then we moved down the coast. And we went to a place called Shackleton Base, which is where Fuchs started from, just to check it. So all he did, push the bows into the ice, everybody climbed up and walked up to the base. 
you can see the, the sea is steaming because it's so warm at minus 1.8. Me dressed to kill. And that's the base underneath that flag. So you climb down, go through the roof hatch. And it was it was in remarkably good condition. It doesn't exist any longer, it's drifted off. Where it's gone, nobody knows. Nearest bit of rock to suit Carl is 300 miles due south of that car. A couple of Russian ships. Um, trawler on the left, reefer on the right, and they're in uh, St Andrews Bay on South Georgia. And you'll see there's a, a tanker in the background to supply the fuel oil for the ships. Big Russian presence down there. Moving slightly south into Deception. Those who've been to Deception may have seen this. It's a beaver. Bass got wind of an American bunch that were going to come and raid this and take this away and they landed and uh, by 12 hours beat this gentleman because the wings were in the hangar at the back. Steaming beach, it's a volcano, you're sailing into a caldera and so what the cruise ships are doing now is to dig a big hole in the beach and let people go for a swim. So I'll just plough through these because a few left to go. Typical transport now, Zodiacs. We plow through the ice. This is where you won't get on cruise ships. This is going down to the gullet between Adelaide Island and the mainland. Some of you may be able to mark, see these two lines here. They're the dog teams. Because we were allowed dogs in those days, they were taken out in about 1981, I think, 1981 or 91. Typical down the peninsula shots. That is Argentine Islands, which then become Faraday Base, and after the uh, 82 war. Uh, and is now, in fact, leased to the Ukrainians as their base. This is the top of Le Mer Channel, if you remember that, you folk, otherwise known as Kodak Crack. And I won't tell you what the mountains are called. And there you can see one of the base huts. So people were living there and then going off by bug dog team into the peninsula, centre of the peninsula, the Bransfield in Paradise Bay. It's down at uh, Stonington Base, which is down in Marguerite Bay. Uh, and we closed that in 1975, took all the usable bits and pieces out. That's the scow that's pulled, towed by uh, one of the ship's launches. In fact, two ladies wintered there in the 50s, Jenny Darlington, and I can't remember the name, Finn Ron's wife, that's it. They're just doing some um, conservation work there. Signy Island, uh, it's another one of the bass bases, that's mainly on a summer base now, it used to be winter base. So I'll throw a few of these in my, one of my mates uh, donated these. These are typical survey party using dogs. <coughs> Huskies, everybody thinks, oh, they're wonderful animals and aren't they beautiful and all the rest of it. Well, they have two traits in life. One is like running and the other is fighting. Um, they enjoy nothing better than a good scrap. So you, you've got to span them out on a steel cable so they can't um, chew through that. And then if they do get into a fight, you generally find just a bit of collar or a tail or something like that left. So what's a bike wheel doing down there? For you chaps would have remembered the cyclometer that you used to put on your front wheel and went tick, 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 tick to measure your mileage. And that's how you do dead reckoning. 
So you do all your navigation on an old fashioned cyclometer just like that. Or a graphic cloud over Gritviken. Um, this is sun setting over the, uh, the mountain. Just a few of the clouds that you get, particularly in the middle of summer. Absolutely incredible clouds. So that's the mate of mine um, carrying the base Gentoo penguin. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is that. I think that's dead on time, isn't it?